changed how the world sees the Pope through his many, many apostolic visits, through his writings, through his accessibility and his, his willingness to engage the culture, and to, again, to try to bring about this culture of life. So we have non-Catholics really, I think, being opened up to an understanding of the Catholic Church and of the role of the papacy in looking to the Pope for moral leadership, even though they might not be Catholic. We see how, too, just how even in death, really, he, he brought people to the church and brought people to Christ. Because when he died, his mass, his funeral mass, was, was televised nationally in the United States. And I remember sitting with my wife and watching the funeral mass in our home on NBC and just just being completely amazed and shocked that a Catholic mass would be televised nationally in our country at this in this time of our history. And again, so we it's we see how John Paul II, even in death, is proclaiming Christ and bringing Christ into the world. He really restored the prestige and influence of the papacy throughout the world for the people looking at the Pope as a moral leader, one who really is called to try to bring about peace in our world, one who really teaches authentically. There is no doubt people know what the Pope teaches and what the Pope, where he stands on things. The modern world might not embrace his vision for a culture of life and a civilization of love, but they knew specifically that he preached that the world should be based on love and life and rooted in Jesus Christ. He also, I think, provided, again, pride in our church for many Catholics, that after the rocky times of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, he really provided a firm foundation for Catholics to know their faith, to want to desire to want to, to learn it and to live it and to be proud to be Catholic in the right sense. Again, he provided this map and blueprint for our church as she moves into this third millennium, where he really began and focused on his work of implementing the decrees of the Second Vatican Council for the greater benefit of the church and of the world. We saw how he energized young people for Christ and really focused through the through world the calling of World Youth Days that we talked about of trying to bring young people into the church into a better and more full and intimate life with Jesus Christ. He also personified and instilled the theological virtues throughout the church, the, faith, the virtues of faith, hope, and love, and really then put the church on this path to embracing these 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 virtues as she moves into the third millennium. So its impact was great and one that cannot be underestimated, and one that must be studied and learned and recognized and remembered as we go forward in the story of our church. So we have this great man, this holy and saintly man, John Paul II, that provides us with, an, with a good example to imitate as we continue the story of the church. So when we come to the end now of our story, and the end of our time together, and we look at these, when we take a step back and look at these 20 sessions, these 20 periods, or these 12 periods of church history that we've discussed and that we've spent time studying and looking at. And there are certain lessons from this time that we've had together that I think we can draw from the history of the church as we move forward into this new millennium of the Christian life. And we can see in particular that really the future of the church will hold many things that we've experienced in the past. We've seen over these last 20 sessions how the church has actively been persecuted and persecuted throughout her existence, sometimes in a violent fashion, sometimes in a nonviolent fashion. But as Christ said, if they persecuted me, it will persecute you. So we have to take stock and recognize and know as we move into this new millennium and in this new century, the 21st century, we recognize and know that the church will continue to be under persecution. There are Catholics still today who are giving their life in various nations and different parts of the world to continue to spread the gospel and participate in the life of the church. We know that, te that temporal government has interfered. We've seen temporal government, secular rulers, interfere in the life of the church over these last 2,000 years. And we have to expect that that will continue as we go forward in this 21st century. We've seen the tension that existed in, and is, it grew between East, the eastern and western halves of the church stemming all the way back from the 4th century up until the 11th century when finally that great schism of 1054 happened and the church split into two halves. And we pray and hope that the work of John Paul II and his successor, Benedict XVI, will bring the two halves of the church back together. That the church will finally, in the words of John Paul II, breathe with both lungs. We've seen how the church has always focused on her missionary efforts and how she needed to spread the gospel through the sending of missionaries throughout the world. 
So we look to and we pray and we ask the Lord to continue to send missionaries of his, from his church throughout the world to continue to spread the good news and bring people into an intimate relationship with Christ and the church. And we see, too, how the church built up, maintained, and defended and shaped the culture of Western civilization. And we pray now during the time of, of Benedict XVI and into the future that the Western world will come back to an embracing of her Christian roots. That Europe in particular will recognize the role the church played in her history and come back. We see, we've seen too, that really ultimately, as we study church history, one thing that we're certain of is the reality and existence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been with the church for these last 2,000 years. The Holy Spirit continues to animate the church. The Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. And we pray, God, that the Holy Spirit may continue its work through, His work through the next new millennium. That we may be filled with the Spirit and the grace from the Spirit in order to actively participate in the life of the church. We see, too, the rise, we saw, too, the rise of Islam in the 7th century and how even now in our modern world we are still shaped and we are still dealing with the, the Muslim movement and how Islam is beginning to take over, unfortunately, Western society. What the Muslims were not unable to do in armed conflict, they're now doing through immigration. And they're taking, in essence, they're, they're growing in numbers in Europe. When Europe is declining demographically and not replacing its population, Islamic immigrants are coming into those countries and taking over. So Western civilization really is at a crossroads and is a, in, a, in an area and a time when it needs to go back and re and embrace its Christian roots. And so we're at a time of great concern, but there are also signs of great hope, as we focused on in our last period together here, the threshold of hope. The church, the church has been placed on a firm foundation by John Paul II and Benedict XVI. And Benedict has specifically given us the answer that we should, and the, and the uh, motivation that we should have as we move forward into the new millennium. He says that life is like a voyage on the sea of history, often dark and stormy, a voyage in which we watch for the stars that indicate the route. The true stars of our life are the people who have lived good lives. They are lights of hope. Certainly Jesus Christ is the true light, the sun that has risen above all the shadows of history. But to reach him, we also need lights close by, people who shine with his light and so guide us along the way. And so I encourage you to adopt these words of Benedict XVI and be people of light. Know and remember the story of our church. Take the story of our church to your family. Take the story of, of our church to your co-workers. Be the people of light. Spread the gospel. Live the life of Christ. And pray that the Lord may give, uh, give you the, his understanding of the role that you should play in his story, in this great story of the Catholic Church. What role can I play, Lord, in helping to further the salvific mission of your church? So continue your study of church history. I hope these 20 sessions is not the end of your study of church history, but the beginning of the study of, your, of church history. I thank you for your time with us, and I pray that God may be with you on your journey.
I don't know if that's something I'd be interested in, but if you are too, then make sure you let this go. <laughs> so, okay, and we'll do some of the questions now. Uh, I was looking through them. Um, like one of them, like the question about Saint, uh, whether or not he should be uh, John Paul the Great is kind of already been answered since that's been decided. So we can skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so what were the first public words uttered by St. John Paul II upon his election in 1978? Why do you think he chose those words? Yes, be not afraid. And so, why? Do you want to answer the second part? No? Anyone else? Because <laughs> he wanted to reassure the faithful in the world that, that the world with Christ and in Christ there's nothing to be afraid of. Rather, trusting in him brings true joy, happiness, and peace. Yes, and it's generally thought that he um, embodied these this trait throughout his entire life. Right. So, okay. Um, next question. Okay, I'm not going to ask y'all. It says list some of Saint John Paul II's encyclicals, and what are their topics, and which one is your favorite? <laughs> now that's a lot of encyclicals and a lot of topics, so I'm not going to just read them all off. But if anyone has one in particular they want to mention. Ryan, did you read it? Uh, no, what is there in the cyclical? Oh, right. It's writing. Uh, yeah, it's, like it's, writing. Like it's a paper. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. I'm, it holds a little more authority than just a regular letter. Right, but is there a length on that? Does anyone know? For in cyclical, like, because I'm sure there is. I'm yeah, sure there's I, so I many words. There might words be a specific length they were supposed to be yeah. between, but it's an official kind of statement from uh, the Pope the current Pope of the day, and about an issue. And some of them are very short, some of them are a couple paragraphs, and some of them are very long. But I don't know what the, if there's a rule for that, if, you know, beyond this length, it's no longer an encyclical or not. So that'll be something to look into. <laughs> but, um, yes, so uh, St. John Paul II wrote quite a few. So if anyone has, does anyone have one in particular? The Theology of the Body actually isn't one that was a series of uh, talks he gave for three years. Uh, it's weekly audiences. So. That's okay. Okay, and the last one he wrote was on the Eucharist and its relationship to the church. That was uh, published on April 17th, 2003, and it was about the Eucharist and the life of the church and the faithful. So that was the last one. Okay, what were the main themes of St. John Paul II's pontificate, and why did he choose those themes? One was spreading the gospel, because mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. believed that we should go out and talk to people, and um, not just sit in the church and pray, right. but go out and spread the word, and implementation of the Second Vatican Council, mm -hmm. to explain what it was all about, right. and teach, teach what it was. Mm -hmm. And back to proper um, catechesis, <laughs> which kind of fell to the wayside for the first couple of decades after Vatican II. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the relationship of uh, man, the man and the woman in, in, in their marriage. Right. And from this theology of the body mm -hmm. talks. Mm -hmm. And what? Prepare the church for the third millennium, focusing mm -hmm. on the Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. you know, one for each yeah, person one. for each year and then the jubilee year right and then also Preparing. going back and focusing on the history of right. the church <coughs> up to the jubilee year and preparing us for the third millennium saint john paul ii greatly expanded the number of holy men and women honored by the church of saints um name some of these saints do you have a special devotion to one of these saints um, if so, you're welcome to share your story, but I am not going to make anyone do that. <laughs> but uh, and I know you mentioned some in the video. Does anyone else have the same thing? Remember that uh, St. John Paul II canonized that wasn't mentioned? Because I was thinking, uh, it wasn't St. Therese of canonized by him? I thought so too. Yeah, because yeah, I don't think yeah, that was mentioned, but I was pretty sure because since she was, she's pretty modern since she was in the lab. The less than 100 years during right. his pontificate. I'm pretty sure she got canonized during. I thought she did. 
Well, the same things that have been going on for 2,000 years. Right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's what's old is new again. I mean, right. Anything we face isn't anything we haven't faced. Still have Islam, still have people not following church teachings. Yeah, still have heretics, still have... Uh, Atheism. Yeah, God, you know. Yeah, you know, people are trying no to promote uh, different teachings against right. the church. No, I just think I think it's now changed significantly in how it's presented. Oh yeah. Whereas Francis is now going, okay, this is evangelization. We now need to worry about where they're coming from instead of just condemning. Right. John Paul did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Before Vatican II, the church was pretty well. We'll just insulate ourselves. And now they well, we have to go around a different way to reach these people instead of just saying this is wrong. Right. We now have to say why are you doing what you. You know, mm -hmm. where is it coming in to see if we can't help the... Yeah, looking at kind of like the whole person concept. Exactly. Okay, why is this person, you know, thinking this, believing this, acting this way? How can we help them? And it's one thing, well, you might remember it, when we taught BBS together, um, I they were talking about, you know, bringing Jesus to the people. And the whole point is, if someone's starving, if they don't have a roof over a head, if they don't have basic needs met, they're not going to want to hear what you have to say about this Jesus person if they're starving. You know, if they have family members dying because they cannot, you know, work, they cannot get food, they cannot get clean water, then, you know, none of that is going to matter to them. And I always thought the church has been good about, you know, recognizing, you know, we need to meet people's basic needs. And sometimes it's not a physical need necessarily, it's an emotional, you know, need. You know, like, I think it was um, Blessed Mother Teresa who talked about the poverty and lack of love that she mm -hmm. sees in people. And that's, you know, we need to reach people not just in actual physical poverty, but that, you know, spiritual, emotional poverty as well. So, and I think that's but what I also Pope think Francis is good at. I think 
this right now, this time period with you know, John Paul and Mother Teresa and all these people, it's a phenomenal.